Hey everyone, it's Mystery Girl with Missy and I'm uh, Missy. Welcome back. I want to say thank you to all of my subscribers for all of your support. It means so much to me. Thank you so much for sticking along with the channel. It's so appreciated. And I want to welcome all new followers. Thank you so much for being here and for hitting that subscribe button. If you haven't done so yet, hit it now. I am using a fair use disclaimer for the photos and videos that I have used in this video. There is a trigger warning. The following video contains material that may be traumatizing for some audiences. This video is intended for audiences 18 and over. This video contains extremely sensitive information and the images are very sensitive. If there are any children in the room, please have them leave the room now. This video may be traumatizing to some. And I just want to remind you, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of this series. And if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe now. Here we are, Willowbrook State School, The Scandals and the Controversy Behind It, Part 4, The Geraldo Rivera Interview. The documentary, sorry. But I do want to let you know, guys, this is a very sensitive video you're about to watch. This is the video that I watched on my first day of employment working with medically frail children. I'm going to share it with you, but I want to make sure you know just how sensitive and disturbing and um, it's hard not to cry. It's hard not to cry. I'm not going to lie to you. It's very sensitive. So if for any reason you can't watch this, I 100% understand. Um, so here we go, guys. Here's the video. It's been more than six years since Robert Kennedy walked out of one of the wards here at Willowbrook and told newsmen of the horror he'd seen inside. He pleaded then for an overhaul of a system that allowed retarded children to live in a snake pit. But that was way back in 1965 and somehow we'd all forgotten. I first heard of this big place with the pretty sounding name because of a call I received from a member of the Willowbrook staff, a Dr. Michael Wilkins. The doctor told me he'd just been fired because he'd been urging parents with children in one of the buildings, building number six, to organize so they could more effectively demand improved conditions for their children. The doctor invited me to see the conditions he was talking about, so unannounced and unexpected by the school administration, we toured building number six. The doctor had warned me that it would be bad. It was horrible. There was one attendant for perhaps 50 severely and profoundly retarded children, children, lying on the floor naked and smeared with their own feces. They were making a pitiful sound, a kind of mournful wail that it's impossible for me to forget. This is what it looked like, this is what it sounded like, but how can I tell you about the way it smelled? It smelled of filth, it smelled of disease, and it smelled of death. We've just seen something that's probably the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. Is that typical of ward life? Uh, yes, there are 5,300 patients at Willowbrook, which is the largest institution for the mentally retarded in the world. Uh, the ones that we saw were the most uh, severely and profoundly retarded. There are thousands there like that, uh, not going to school, sitting on the ward all day, not being talked to by anyone, only one or two or three people to take care of 70 people on the ward, sharing the same toilet, contracting the same diseases together. 100% uh, of patients at Willowbrook uh, contract hepatitis within six uh, months of being in the institution. Most patients at some time in their life have uh, parasites. The incidence of uh, pneumonias and, uh, is greater than any uh, other group of people that I think exist in this country. Uh, trauma is severe because these patients are left together on a ward, 70 retarded people, uh, basically unattended, uh, fighting for a small scrap of paper on the floor to play with, uh, fighting for the attention of the attendants who are overworked, trying to clean them, uh, feed them, clothe them, and if possible, pay a little attention to them and work with them and develop their intelligence. But what in fact happens is that they go downhill. Two days after our first unofficial visit, a camera crew was given an authorized tour of the facility. 
While unannounced, we'd found the children naked and basically unattended. They were shown kids who were fully clothed and generously attended. It was to ensure that this sudden improvement in the quality of life was permanent that we returned without the knowledge of the school administration and through a back door. It was the first day all over again. To these people, life is just one hour after another of, kind of looking at the floor. There's no training on here. Can the children be trained? Yes, every child can be trained. You know, these kids, there's no effort. We don't know what these kids are capable of doing. Uh, some training programs go on at Willowbrook, but the state provides a fair minimum, just enough so that they can call this place a school. The state, uh, clearly these kids aren't getting any training. I mean, I don't think I have, even have to say that. They're just sitting here on the ward. Th these are the hours during which they should be in school, and they're not. What ward is this now? This is a building 27. These patients do have clothes on today, but as you can see, the one thing that can't be hidden is that there are no training programs that all these patients do is sit during the day. Uh, they're not kept uh, occupied. Uh, their life is just uh, hours and hours of endless nothing to do, no one to talk to, no expectations, just a, a, an endless life of misery and, and filth. What you see it, uh, makes you think that it's hopeless that they can't be trained, but you know, they, they only look this way because they haven't have ever had opportunity for training. They, uh, you know, if you or I were left to sit on a ward uh, surrounded by other mentally retarded people, we would probably begin looking like this too. The Willowbrook State School is this country's largest home for the mentally retarded. It's called a school, but that's more a statement of aspiration than of fact. Fewer than 20% of the 5,230 people who are kept here attend any kind of classes. When the state of New York entered a period of economic retrenchment two years ago, a hiring freeze was clamped on this and other institutions in the Department of Mental Hygiene. In the intervening months, Willowbrook lost 600 employees through attrition. For the budget for fiscal 71-72, the governor recommended a hold-the-line appropriation of $630 million for the Mental Hygiene Department. The legislature, seeking to trim the waste and fat from the budget, cut it down to about $600 million. Then the governor decided that even $600 million was too much and cut it even further, all the way down to $580 million. Willowbrook lost another 200 employees, and a situation that two years ago was bad became hopeless. The attendants tried to care for their wards, but were simply overwhelmed. The attendant-to-patient ratio, which should be about 4 to 1, dropped to 30 to 40 to 1. And the average feeding time per patient, which should be 20 or 30 minutes, went down to 2 and 3 minutes. Many of the profoundly retarded children are capable of, of feeding themselves. In my building, we had no staff to train them in a systematic way to use utensils to feed themselves. That can be done, but uh, what's necessary is to feed them. Uh, you take a bowl of, of uh, food that you've made into a mush-like substance with a big spoon, and you ladle it out into their mouth in the buildings where... The kids can't feed themselves. Uh, there are so few attendants that there is only an average in time, three minutes per child per feeding. How much time would be needed to do a job adequately? The same amount of time that your children or my children would want to have to eat breakfast. What's the consequence of three minutes per meal per child? The consequence is death from pneumonia. North of the city, on the way to Bear Mountain, is a lovely looking place called the Letchworth Village Rehabilitation Center. Set among the hills and woods of suburban Rockland County, a passerby could easily mistake the place for a country club or a college campus. But the early morning mist gave the place an eerie feeling, like a set from a horror movie. And once inside, that feeling became suddenly appropriate. Congressman Mario Biaggi had planned an official tour of the facility for 10 o'clock in the morning, but... By this time, wary of what I felt were attempts on the part of the Department of Mental Hygiene to make the situation look better than it really was, my camera crew and I got there two hours before that. As the hour of the official tour approached, bundles of clothing were brought in for the children and a process of cleaning up was begun. Even so, none of these cosmetic changes could do much to improve the place. Who's in charge here, Jerry? This is Mrs. Nixon. I'm Congressman Biagi. How are you? Why are these, why are these uh, patients unclothed? We don't have 
have enough clothing. We don't have the proper help to keep clothing on them. We have a few nudists that will not keep clothes on. They will pull them off. But most of all, we don't have the help to keep the kids properly dressed. We're talking about more money for the, for the institution. Well, that we could use because then we will have more help. How, on, how on the staff are you? Very understaffed. There are days we have four or five attendants to take care of a hundred and... Condition in a very beautiful ground, very well-built buildings. Uh, inside we have housed the children of many of our citizens who are subjected to the what appears to be the worst possible conditions I've ever seen in my life. I've visited penal institutions all over the country. I've visited hospitals all over the country. I've visited the, the worst brigs in the... In the uh, in the military, nothing's like it. I've, I've never, never seen anything like it. About 25% of the funding for Letchworth Village comes from the federal government, and one of the requirements for continued eligibility is that there be 80 square feet of space per patient. Here they get only 35 square feet. In the face of this terrible overcrowding, there was a ward there that stood empty because they hadn't the funds to hire the 38 people it would take to staff it. How can this be? I think... Well, we need 38 additional positions and we would be able to staff this area and reduce our overcrowding in overcrowded areas. That's a sin, my God, a sin. Well, we have submitted and we're expecting that we might be getting them and then we'll be able to reduce the overcrowding in certain areas. There's at least one more horrifying aspect of life at Letchworth. More than 300 able-bodied patients, both physically and mentally able to work outside the institution, are not being allowed to. They're being used to fill the places of the too few employees. They get paid $2 a week for their efforts, about what they'd make each hour on the outside. And there was another development on the day we visited Letchworth. It was eight days after our investigation had begun. Governor Rockefeller, amidst a growing public outcry over the conditions at Willowbrook, made an announcement. He was restoring the $20 million he had stricken from the budget of the Department of Mental Hygiene. Willowbrook, it was said, would be able to rehire 300 of the 900 employees it had lost since November 1970. Letchworth Village would be able to rehire about 200. But the additional employees, while perhaps slowing the downward course of these two institutions, would not be able to change the basic nature of the two places, mere depositories for the retarded. You think what we showed on television in the past week is an accurate reflection of the problem of the situation? I think it focused and made vivid the problems at Willowbrook. You think it was an honest portrayal? I think it was an honest portrayal of the problems at their worst. Uh, I, it may not tell the whole story of, of Willowbrook, and it certainly doesn't tell the whole story of the retarded, but it does describe unmistakably the kind of problems that we've seen, and now thanks to the, uh, to, to the coverage, many people have seen. If the public eye leaves Willowbrook and all of the other places, and we once again uh, find ourselves, we and the directly involved parents, trying to go it alone, then I think we struggle to maintain our few gains, and we struggle slowly to get ahead. And perhaps if you were to come back a year from now and look again, you might see that we'd made headway. I expect you would. But you won't see it all solved in two weeks. I wish you would go back in two weeks, and in two weeks, and in two weeks, uh, because I think they, that the, a, a window on these conditions, and maybe even allowing to begin to see what not only what is, but what it could be, and even what it is already in some places. So to reinforce the sense of hopefulness and to reestablish in people's minds that we're talking about human beings with potential, I would hope that you would see continued change, and if you didn't see it, that you'd say so. 
Two weeks after that interview, I took Dr. Miller up on his invitation to revisit Willowbrook. I found no meaningful change in the quality of life for the 5,230 people who live here. The attendants are trying their best, but the staff is just too small to do anything more than just try and keep the place clean. When there's only one person to take care of 30 or 40, nothing good can possibly happen. No rehabilitation, no training, nothing. The attendants are as much the victim of the conditions here as the patients are. And this visit has ruined the prisons and the hospitals. The way we care for our mentally retarded is the last great disgrace. The story of Willowbrook and of Letchworth Village is a story of degradation. A real-life horror story of lack of attention, of filth, and of children living as animals live an uncivilized and human existence. But our intention is not just to horrify, but also to demonstrate that it doesn't have to be that way. This is Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. It houses the Regional Center for the Mentally Retarded. The director of the program is Dr. Richard Koch. Last month, at the invitation of several parents groups, he toured the Willowbrook facility. The conditions that I saw at Willowbrook uh, are somewhat like this. When you enter the building I entered, the smell is, is so overwhelming, it's almost nauseating. I frankly don't understand how they have people who will work there, to be honest with you. And I think that's the first thing that hits you. Secondly, uh, you find uh, many patients in the same room, all milling about, uh, with nothing to do. Now, I may have seen an unusual situation, but I don't believe so, because I saw three different buildings. And uh, in those buildings, I did not see any kind of program. I saw men sitting around masturbating. I saw boys and girls lying on the floor, uh, some of them naked. Uh, in other words, it, it just was uh, without program, and I think that is the crucial thing. It's just simply too big. The important thing, though, about the Wilbrook situation, as I see it, is, is that the system is feeding on itself. In other words, there isn't any alternative for parents uh, that need help. The state is only reaching out its hand primarily with residential care in mind. And the, what parents want, by and large, are a rich variety of programs, primarily in the community. And the reason we've been able to get an expansion of our program in California, even with Mr. Reagan as governor, uh, is because this program is showing that it has cut the rate of institutionalized retarded persons in California to practically almost in half in just five years. Public pressure can apparently force change in California as well as it does here in New York. They had a system that resembled ours until 1965. That was when a prominent European expert on retardation said something that was widely publicized. After touring the California facilities, he said, My God, you don't care for your mentally retarded children as well as we in Europe care for our cattle. The remark eventually caused them to dramatically restructure their approach. The heart and soul of the California system is now no longer the large state institutions. It's the regional center. Children's Hospital is one of the 13 centers in the state. Various programs are administered in neighborhoods all over Los Angeles County and the San Fernando Valley from here. Sub offices provide whatever services a family with a retarded child needs, be it a daycare center, a sheltered workshop, or medical care. The idea is to shift the care and training of the retarded to their own communities. In other words, to help the parents keep their children at home. Education for the retarded in California is as much a right as education for normal children and they're working toward the development of a public school program for every child, no matter the degree of retardation. This is a developmental center for handicapped minors. All these children are severely or profoundly retarded. This is an entirely a state-supported uh, program and provides tremendous relief to the parent in terms of daycare. Now, these children would be parallel to the children at Willowbrook, for instance. Oh, yes. All of these children would be in an institution for the retarded if we didn't have this kind of program for them. The fact is, in years past, I used to recommend institutional care myself for similar children. Now, New York is doing some of this, but here again, uh, we've realized that the community programs uh, should have top priority in terms of state dollars rather than last priority. And I think your priorities are mixed up in New York in terms of serving the retarded. Your top investment is in institutions. Our top investment is in the Department of Education and, and providing a program for the child while he's at home in terms of daycare. For example, these kids can go to school at age three years. So they start at very young, and that helps a great deal for parents.
And when parents are actively uh, encouraged to keep their child at home, they do so because they know they can have the help of regional centers or public schools or the health department in terms of services, etc. For the mild to moderately retarded over school age, the regional center assists in the finding of employment in one of the many sheltered workshops in the area. In the workshop, you are seeing uh, less severely retarded persons and the tremendous importance of this is that it gives the retarded person something to do during the daytime that gives them dignity. And they earn a little money with it and they do something useful. They become a contributor to society instead of a drag on society. If you look around and see and just visualize all these people sitting home vegetating, here they're, they are in the stream of life and doing their own thing. They're earning their own way. Dr. Cope told me time and again that the importance of prevention could not be overemphasized. Families with histories of genetic retardation are counseled not to have more children. And if there's a great probability that a pregnant woman is carrying a retarded child, she's tested. And if the fetus is found brain damaged, the center recommends a therapeutic abortion. The center also runs an extensive program of community education and prenatal care, the lack of which is a prime cause of retardation. There you are. There you are. Yeah. No, actually, uh, this child has Down syndrome, and uh, she's just as retarded as most of your patients at Willowbrook. And we're helping this family to keep her at home, and the mother is doing a beautiful job on her. Hey. And uh, the important thing is we're also providing genetic counseling to the family. This is an inherited form of Down syndrome, and we have uh, advised the mother that this is true, and frankly, have advised them not to have any more of their own children. How is this child being better serviced by being home rather than being in an institution like Willowbrook? Well, for example, she has access to one of the finest pediatric facilities in the world right here at Children's Hospital. If she were in a state hospital, she wouldn't have access to this kind of a facility. How about parental care? Is that making a difference in this child? Parental care makes a difference in every child, even the very retarded person. If you could get that across to people, that retarded people are more normal than they are abnormal. They have feelings, love, hate, etc., just like normal people. The only thing is, is they simply don't think as fast as a normal person. How old is she? She's two years old. Two years old? Right. What would be happening to her if she were in a place like Willowbrook? Uh, well, frankly, probably nothing. But Dr. Koch admits that for some retarded, perhaps one and a half to three percent, 24-hour residential care will always be necessary. And some California institutions, Fairview State and Orange County, for example, could be described in the most unflattering terms as smaller, cleaner Willowbrooks. But while Willowbrook has a large waiting list, the California institutions are being rapidly emptied. In five years, their total population is down from more than 14,000 to less than 10,000, and that number continues to go down. But even in the area of 24-hour residential care, they're moving to improve the quality of life. This is the Spastic Children's Foundation, a private organization that provides total care. It costs $14 a day for a child to live here. It costs the state of New York $21 a day to house a child in Willowbrook. And if the California parent can't afford the bill, the state contributes based on the family's ability to pay. This is an individualized program. Each child has a prescription for therapy, for academic training, for social adjustment, for feeding training, toilet training, every facet of his life that he needs help with. We sit down as a staff and we talk about his total needs, not just today, but where is he going to be in the future and how does his family relate to him because all of these things are a part of the whole with this child. See, we see these people as very important human beings. It's a five-day resident program, so the child actually goes home for two Right, because we want the family to remain the controlling factor in this child's life presently. We started this series as kind of an expose on conditions at Willowbrook, and one of the things that really struck me as, as barbaric is the, well, the toilet facilities. They're mm -hmm. so awful, so filthy. Is this much more money to keep it this way? It is one cent more. It doesn't cost any more to be clean. It doesn't cost any more to be cheerful and bright and colorful. It's a matter of interest in providing and seeing these children as important people. It's how much status you give to them. And uh, sometimes because they can't respond and say what they like and dislike, it's very easy for people to just sit back and think, well, this is good enough. But it isn't good enough. They deserve everything that you and I want out of life. But they can't get it for themselves. Here, the toothbrushes have the children's names on them. In Willowbrook, there were no toothbrushes. Hi, Richard. How you doing? Uh, fine. I see you're copying a Van Gogh there. You better watch it. You get in trouble. Yeah. How long did you live in the state? 
school before you came here? About ten years. You like it better here? Yes. The thing that impressed me most on the California trip was an apartment where retarded people live in semi-independence. Irene, how do you like it living here? I love it. How come? I can do my own thing. I think the main difference between the approach of New York and that of California to the problem of caring for the mentally retarded is that they treat the retarded as people. We treat them as something less. We haven't given the people who run the New York program equal time to give their side of the story. Well, as Edward R. Murrow once said, on some stories there is no other side. Perhaps the governor can defend and explain away the budget cuts for the Department of Mental Hygiene, and perhaps Dr. Miller can explain and defend the filthy dehumanizing conditions we found in this and other buildings, but they won't do it on this program. What we found and documented here is a disgrace to all of us. This place isn't a school, it's a dark corner where we throw children who aren't pretty to look at. It's the big town's leper colony. How long have you been at Willowbrook? 18 years. How long were you given physical therapy in school? Five years. Are you still going to school? No. Why? I'm over, over age. You're too old? Yes. Would you like to go back to school? Yes, I do. What would you want to learn if you went back to school? Learn not my reading more. Learn how to read? Yeah. How, how is, how is it living on the ward that you live? Disgrace. Is it disgrace? Yes. Why? The, con the conditions are getting worse every time you cut the blood to but even Bernard, with his tragically eloquent plea for help, doesn't really understand that what Willowbrook needs isn't more money. More money would certainly help. At least the kids would have clothes and they'd be cleaner than they are now, but they'd still basically be human vegetables in a detention camp. What we need is a new approach. We have to change the way we care for our mentally retarded. We ask for change. We demand change. What you've seen here just doesn't have to be this way. You can't treat humans like dogs in a kennel. There is no place where you can mass produce care, compassion, and concern for people. It is impossible. It is fundamentally unsound. The assembly line workers for cars. If you do not work for people, people need humanity. Geraldo Rivera, 1997. Geraldo is, is an investigative journalist, talk show host, political commentator, and television personality. Particularly relevant to tonight, his expose, Willowbrook, The Last Great Disgrace, would go on to win a Peabody Award in 1972. I'm pleased now to invite Geraldo Rivera to share some of his initial thoughts and reflections on the expose 50 years later. Welcome, Geraldo Rivera. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's very, very difficult to, to watch that. It's uh, the fascinating thing is how it's a half a century ago and it feels so current it feels so immediate and the the dangers of neglect are so vivid I'm sorry in in that, in that video, it's, it's the people who are developmentally disabled, and I apologize for the language and the R word, Bernard gets so mad at me, and I, it, it, and I, I put it in the past, but that's 50 years ago. But the, the humanity is the same. The solution is the same. What developmentally disabled 
people need is the same thing able-bodied people need. It's, they need to have their human potential realized. They have to be able to be in a situation where they can be as much as 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 much as they can possibly be. I I think the 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 promotion of the idea of the community based residence that was perhaps the most important development of of that investigative saga. It's something I'm still deeply involved in now with life's work and the other charities that we support because the, the best thing for any child is one-to-one -one attention someone should know what the child likes to eat what the child likes to wear someone should be however handicapped there is There is not only for the humanity of the of the recipient of the care, but also for the giver of the care. There is an exhilaration that comes from allowing a handicapped person, giving them the tools they need. You know, now you see the, with the Paralympics, and uh, you know, with all of now with, with all of the the community-based charities coast to coast now really spreading throughout the western world you see the same points you want the parents to be involved in a situation where they don't feel helpless where they don't feel alone where they they don't feel ostracized because their child is has special needs you want the, them to be in a place where the parents of willowbrook have all aged out generally speaking. I mean, there's some like me hanging on into their 70s, but what happens to the the children that are now adults themselves? Young adults, then middle-aged adults, and then they're going to be seniors also. Because now they they live and I, I don't mean to bandy these pronouns, but now the handicapped live the same life expectancy if given the conditions as the able-bodied. The institution was developed for one reason. It was the most efficient way in terms of taxpayer dollars to take care of this population. So you herded them all into the institution, you closed the door, deprived even the parents of access, the outside world denied access, Bobby Kennedy only got in because he was senator from New York State in 1965. So the horror was allowed to fester and metastasize and become that awful, awful place. In those words, this is what it looked like. This is what it sounded like. But how can I tell you about the way it smelled? I swear to God, that is my, my nightmare 50 years later. So now we have Medicaid and Medicare, we have systems and the, there's constant beefs with with the government of, of, you know, underfunding and all the rest. But this is a sea change what has happened. And I see Bernard there and he can speak for himself. But his story in many ways is the most eloquent testimony Bernard wasn't disabled mentally. He had cerebral palsy. Three years old, he was thrown into this institution. For 18 years, he, he languished there, ignored, fighting to get any kind of education, any kind of personal attention. And then he met uh, Dr. Mike Wilkins, a saint, and, and Bill Bronston and the others, and understood when he turned 21 his rights. And then, you know, finally liberating himself from the institution and becoming the wonderful, engaging man he is today, having a wonderful career, you know, uh, helping reform as patient advocate, 
uh, for the state, the things that were so awful. And I, and Bernard, you know, when he's become such a such a prominent advocate, and I, I just, you know, I love him. He's my brother, and as I said, he can speak for himself. But Bernard is what we want for everyone that was formally institutionalized to get freedom to be somebody to be somebody not just one of those creatures that you step over and you beat slop to i mean isn't that horrible when you think about it that that porridge that they made mushing up bread and milk and shoving it down the mouths and then as the, as the food went down their their throats getting into their lungs and causing pneumonia and killing them 25 years old maybe if they're lucky if they had life expectancy of course we have to be vigilant of course we have to constantly fight for a fair share of course we have to keep the parents involved and uh, you know life's work in this our, our charity we have a, a respite center for adults uh, of, of the of, of the disabled because it has to be, the whole family has to be engaged. You want to keep people engaged. You want to keep the parents engaged. You want the child to have a relationship as another saint, Dr. Cook said in, in their children's lives. I'm very proud of what we did 50 years ago. The, you know, we've raised funds, you know, John Lennon did a concert and we used to do the boxing matches and now we do the golf tournament. You know, it, 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 it's a it's a grind. It is you have to constantly think of new ways to to fund the activity. You have to you have to buy into the evolution. We never the, the reason I'm so proud of that. I haven't seen that completed film in decades, decades. I think that's why it's such it, it's such a visceral reaction in me. But I'm proud that social work schools and all the rest play it for the young young professionals coming into you know uh, that that the field of, of caring for the disabled because it reminds this was New York City this wasn't you know Kazakhstan this was on Staten Island in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty and it was allowed to happen you know it's funny. I know it's going to be over Bernard. This is this is the key to building number six. This is the key that Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Bronson got me. Governor Carey gave it to me in the, I, I forget the year when they finally closed in 80 something, 86 maybe. And he gave me the key. To, this is like, I'm more proud of this than Emmys or Peabody's or anything. This is, this says what? Thank Story. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And, and um, I, I'm going to get the wonderful opportunity to uh, also formally introduce Bernard as, as well, too. Uh, I, you know, as we move to the panel discussion portion of, uh, of this event, um, I just want to remind everyone to please submit any questions that you may have in the, in the Q&A tab. I see many coming in uh, for the for the latter portion uh, of the Q&A as well, too. And again, uh, to make this uh, event universally accessible, there will continue to be live captioning by an actual human transcriptionist tonight and can be accessed via the CC button on the toolbar. So as Geraldo already had mentioned, uh, Rivera had just been, uh, Geraldo Rivera has already mentioned, we're honored to have another very special guest joining us tonight, and that's Bernard Carabello, who may look familiar to you as he's featured in the expose. Um, Bernard is a former resident of the Willowbrook State School, a disability activist and founder of the Self-Advocacy Association of New York State. In November 2020, Bernard was the recipient of an honorary doctorate of human letters from the College of Staten Island, City University of New York uh, in 2022 in recognition of his distinguished career in disability advocacy he was inducted into the New York State Independent Living Council Hall of Fame. We're also joined by co-moderator today, uh, Eric Goldberg, uh, and I see him there. 
uh, who's going to also ask questions of our guest. Eric is a self-advocate, a GED graduate for CSI's Continuing Studies and the great Melissa Riggio Higher Education Program, which I had the distinct honor of overseeing when I was at the CSI. Eric is also co-chair of the Staten Island Developmental Disabilities Council Willowbrook Legacy Committee and member of the council's executive board. So uh, I have a question that relates to Bernard, and, and I, I'm going to ask Bernard to respond as well, too, to you, Geraldo, if it's cool. Can I start asking you a question that relates to Bernard? You, form, you formed a lifelong connection to each other. Um, can you talk, uh, and you covered it a little bit already, uh, can you talk about how your relationship with Bernard began and developed, and perhaps how your relationship has affected your views of people with disabilities and, and advancing inclusion. And again, I know you've covered some already, but I'd love to get into your relationship just a little more. Well, the most important thing to remember is that my mustache is a lot nicer than Bernard's. <laughs> I mean, it, it, and we, we, the older we get, the more we look alike. You know, he's, uh, He's my, he's my brother as much as my brother Craig is in the room. Bernard is part of the family, you know, and I, I think he feels the same. We've been, uh, you know, uh, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid for a long time. Uh, uh, you know, the relationship has, has, has been one of love, you know, uh, listening to his wisdom based on his experience and his, his, his deep intellect. You know, it's, we love hanging out. We talk about old times and we talk about new times. He has, uh, he's, he's very political. When I liked Donald Trump, he, he really was really very upset with that, but he forgave me when I, uh, when I saw the light. I don't want to get political about it, but uh, uh, you know, he's, he is, I think, in my view, the most effective advocate for the, the, the disabled, the disabled community, uh, you know, because when you, when you take the time to listen, you hear the wisdom of life experience. And I wish that he could speak at every school of social work in this country. Uh, you know, he's a very, very special person in our life. Our, my kids were raised uh, you know, with him, around him, uh, and as a result, you know, I never had any experience with the develop, with develop, uh, disabilities before. Nobody in my family was disabled. That's why they, uh, one of the reasons that was such a shock to me when I went into Willowbrook. I, you know, I, I of course had seen Down syndrome uh, kids uh, once in a while, but not, not even a lot of that I, I, because families had a whole different attitude. And look at the Kennedys, how they closeted uh, Rosemary. You know, it's uh, now we, we we feel differently about it. Where you know, parents are parents are parents. You know, it's uh, it's a very different world, and I I credit him with really being an an, an, instru an instrument of social change and a historic figure. Thank you, Harold. And Bernard, I don't think you could have, I think this is the best introduction anyone has ever given in the history of interviews. Bernard, please, if you could share with us a, a little bit about your relationship with Geraldo, uh and what that relationship has been to you as well, too. Sorry about the technical issue before. So, Geraldo, glad to have you. Um, you know, thank you for all you've done. <laughs> As someone with a disability myself, I know my life has been better than it could have been because of your efforts at Willowbrook. Has the expose impacted your life? Well, Eric, it changed my life in many ways, some superficial and others deep. 
and meaningful, profound, superficial way it propelled me at a very young age. I was 27, 28 years old. Uh, I was a year in the business when it, when uh, Willowbrook happened. It propelled me uh, to a kind of a celebrity uh, that uh, was it affected my life. You know, I, I went from making a you know, a couple hundred dollars a week to being a you know someone with a with a car and I could buy my own apartment and so forth. Spiritually, in, in more meaningful terms, it changed my it changed everything in my life. It changed how I see life itself. It was something that was I, I had no children myself. I, I became very parental in a way. I mean, now we're immediately starting in 1972. When I see a family with a, 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 with a disability, whether an adult or a, a child, I feel like I am related to them. It's a it's an unusual. You know, I, I, reporters can get emotionally involved in stories, but I, I, this story became my world. It became my life. It changed everything. And and I, I mean that when I say that when I see a family with disabilities, it, it's like, and they feel the same vibe. I get that vibe and, and wherever I go. When I, I if there's, if there's a, 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 a teenager with Downs or whatever it is, you know, we look at each other in the eye and I know you, you know me. And it's, uh, so it's been everything to me, Eric. It's, uh, you know, I, I hope that that's on my tombstone or my epitaph rather than I opened Al Capone's vault and I got my nose broken and a brawl with the skinheads. You know, I, I, want, I want Willowbrook, which is the capstone of my career and which is the center of my life aside from my own children. Uh, you know, I, it is, it is everything to me. It changed everything. Nothing was the same the day after that story here, Eric. Thank you. Um, and it will be, and you're, trust, uh, you're such a good supporter, and, and thank you again. Um, I've, got, I've got another question it, from me. It is hard to watch the images in this series, even for me. I, I have to be honest, like you, Geraldo, I was tearing up through most of it myself. What were the most difficult images for you to see and experience? If, if, I, if I had to reduce it to one image, it was the contrast between Willowbrook, the physical plant, you know, like where the College of Staten Island is now, that relatively lovely facility, the grounds, the big buildings, imposing, impressive buildings, and once inside, the image of the child with his or her pants down around their knees under the sink in the bathroom making that sound and nobody there. And, you know, it's, it's, old men get emotional. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about it. No, it's, it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine. Like I said, me, myself, having a disability and having a brother who has uh, a disability and signs himself and can't really talk, it, it, got, it, it gets to me too, and I try to help him as much as possible. So to the next question, uh, you know the Willowbrook Mile is slated to open in September. We are hoping you will continue to support your efforts as uh, actually, this is not a question. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> all right now, sorry. You know the uh, you you do. Uh, you, I don't know. You know the Willowbrook Mile is slated to open in September. We are hoping you will continue to support our efforts to remember the past and protect the future. Finally, uh, protect the future and 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 come please come because you're a big app you're a big asset to us thank you as always and 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 you're an inspiration to me i have a brother who 
who's, uh, you know, got a disability, uh, you know, uh, a, a disability himself, he's MR, and, and, and you've been such an inspiration of me helping him as well. So thank you. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you, Eric. And yes, Bernard and I will be there, God willing. Okay. Yes. And Eric, I think you have uh, uh, one more question for uh, Bernard, I think. Yes, I do, actually. Uh, okay, so uh, let me just find it here. Okay, so a question for you, Bernard. And Bernard, you've been my biggest advocate as well. I know I, I've reached out to you a couple of times, and you've always been so, so helpful and always guided me. I first want to thank you for all you have done, as I said, as being an advocate. How can we today ensure that Willowbrook doesn't happen again? Is telling the story enough? We have to keep in people who have in the past and make sure it doesn't happen again in the future. The next, we got to educate the next so that you take over and make sure people get better services than they get today. Very well said, very well said. And like I, like I, uh, Ill, uh, like I said earlier, you've been a guiding light to me as well, you know. Uh, so thank you, Bernard. And it's up, it's up, it's up to you, to you all to make sure that you all get what you want and not, and not to take and again that they give you because they feel it's better to, for you. You all need to speak up and advocate for you. And for other people around me. Yes, and I and I and I just a little side. I've been doing that. That's why I'm on the Willowbrook Legacy Committee, a co-chair on the SIDDC, and you know to advocate for others who can't advocate for themselves. You know to continue the legacy that you, Geraldo, has put forward, and you, Bernard, have put forward. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gerardo, uh, Bernard, and Eric uh, for, for that special session. Um, uh, Eric and I have many more questions for you, but I know the audience has questions for, for you as well. Uh, so I think we're going to move now to the audience question and our uh, question and answer segment. Uh, again, please push your questions in the Q&A section and we'll try to get to as many uh, of you as possible, as your questions as possible. I'm so pleased now to introduce Dr. Catherine Lavender, uh, CSI History Professor, Director of the Bertha Harris Women's Center, Community Advocate and Co-Chair of CSI's Willowbrook Legacy Committee. Uh, Catherine has been monitoring the questions submitted uh, for, for, for us and so Catherine, if you could take it away, that'd be wonderful. I'll try. There are so many questions coming in, and a lot of the questions are people who want to thank you personally, both Bernard and Geraldo, for the impact that you've had. Many of them, and I'm, I'm going to make sure that you see these personally, many of them talk about the, the impact on directly on their family, family members who would have ended up in a place like Willowbrook if your activism had not led to its closure. So I think it's really important for you to feel that love. There's so much love for you in the community and so many thankful people. You've had a really important impact on many people's lives. There also are a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to sum them together a little bit so we can get to several of them. One of the questions that comes up a lot is from people who might themselves want to be journalists. We have a number of documentary film students that are attending and people who are working on becoming journalists. And they'd like to know about how you were able to build trust with the people that you reported on. I mean, the relationship you built with Bernard is really an important part of your journalism. So could you speak a bit about that? About how your method developed to make that possible? I was an activist lawyer a young lawyer for a group called the Young Lords, actually, a Puerto Rican activist group. And they had activist doctors who helped service the Puerto Rican community in East Harlem. And one of those doctors serendipitously 
uh, well, well, two of them, Bill Bronston and, and Mike Wilkins, were both doctors. Their initial um, job was at the, as I recall, the uh, the public, I forget the name of the, uh, the it was a federally funded a federal hospital where they had on Staten Island, uh, and they, the uh, I met the doctors who were advocating for the Native American nurses. Uh, for some reason, the, this public health service hospital had many Native American women working as nurses, and they were being paid less than the uh, than the uh, you know the rest of the uh, population, the other nurses. So the, I met Dr. Wilkins in that capacity. Uh, we did that story, uh, and he trusted me. And then when the time came uh, for him to confront the Willowbrook management, so to speak, he reached out, reached out to me. We had continued the relationship, talking about 1971, and, and well, basically it was all of 1971, 1970, 1971. Uh, I think the most important thing a young reporter can do is to is to foster trust with the source of the story. You've got to you got to be true to your word. You've got to you know you've got to honor your confidences. You've got to do your homework. I mean, I think one of the most powerful things about the Willowbrook documentary, looking back on it, is the fact that we weren't just complaining about what happened at Willowbrook. We were offering up an alternative for the same or less money tax-wise, an alternative, a community-based alternative to the big institutions. You can't mass produce care the way you mass produce a Ford or a Chevy. You know, you've got, it's, it's the humanity of the, of, of the client has to always be center, center most. Engaging their family, Recognizing that you know government is basically one big mass of inertia to get it to do anything is very difficult. Uh, you, you've got to have. I, I think the best thing is to be the kind of person who not only complains, exposes, but also offers a solution to the problem that you're complaining about. And you don't see even now, you don't see nearly enough of that. You see a lot of people with their podcasts and their, you know, there's, the, there's more media than ever. I mean, you'd never, you could never these days, it seems to me, have a place like Willowbrook with everybody with a iPhone or whatever it is, the, the staffers would uh, would rat out the management. I mean, you'd never, you'd, but, but it, it's not just, journalism is not just about quantity. It's about responsibility. What's this about? Who's the, what's the problem? And what are you gonna do about the problem? I think that the public needs some guidance. They need, you know, without sounding pretentious, they need education. They need to be informed. No one can be engaged emotionally in a problem unless you tell them what it is and what, what's going on. It's a what's going on. That story, when that story hit, that was like lightning bolts hit New York City. And to move the, you know, this historically cynical small town of, you know, what is it, 15 million people in the metropolitan area? I mean, that shows you, well, you all saw it. You've seen, probably seen it before. The power of those images. Nobody would justify or explain away those images. They were intolerable. Yeah. And uh, for a young journalist, or young would-be journalist, you've got a computer, you've got, you know, if you have an idea, talk to people, research it thoroughly, and, and maybe reach out to somebody in a, in a media outlet near you, or, you know, I'm not, I'm not into how you get the job, but the one thing you can do is go to social work school. And that's one way, if that's your interest, education, early education, uh, uh, you know, the deal with 
disability, if, if disability, if, if solving or alleviating the problems with disabilities is your thing, you've got to immerse yourself. You got to understand what you're talking about. You got to talk to, you know, Bernard has been my, my eyes, so to speak. He's, he's the most effective. This whole concept. Let me just back up. This whole concept of client advocacy and client responsibility. He helped invent that when he went to work for New York State. He was the one who, you know, he even something like uh, like language. And you saw some of the horrible language in that old documentary. Bernard is the one that told me about the R word. He said, I can't say that anymore. Would I say the N word? No. We, the R word is like, don't, don't say it anymore. Why? Didn't let me explain about the uh, dignity and self-worth and uh, self-image and self-esteem and respect. You know, so that, maybe that's just a little thing, but I think it's not a little thing. I think it's a big thing. Uh, you know, just think about all those movies where the R word was used and the, and the, and the person being referred to with that expression was the loser. You know, that's why he told me to drop it. I thought, okay, I get it. Now I get it. That was like social change. He changed my mind. I helped to change a lot of other people's minds through my 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 media out. But how you get a job in media, that's you gotta you gotta be scrappy. You know, you gotta take your shot, start small, have your own my my daughter, 16 years old, in her school started an online magazine. My 16 year old. You know, that, do that, do that. Someone's going to see it. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways you could plug into media or social work, but you've got to be your own advocate also. Because nothing's going to come. Nothing's going to come and say, oh, here it is. Because not everybody, you know, is, uh, you know, is born with a silver spoon or whatever. Thank you. And, and then, I mean, I think that leads into another question that's come up over and over again. And it's really, I mean, I think you've answered how this has affected you. But I think the other question that comes up, people want to know how Bernard overcame that start in life to become such an amazingly effective advocate, not just for yourself, I mean, for yourself, of course, but for many people and to really change a system that was not set up to welcome you. And so people would like to hear about what it was that was the spark for you. And especially people who today are trying to become self-advocates and advocates themselves. Do you have some advice? What's the lesson you can teach them?
Side of the institution to tell the story, which were completely inaccurate. For instance, that the people were there because they were dangerous, rather than because there was this desire to treat them in the early days and then a failure to live up to that. So that's a very important point. <laughs> It's true. 
I was, oh, go ahead, Toraldo. I, just, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when during the mayoral race, Eric Adams, who's a good man, and I like him, the mayor, uh, when he was a candidate, I knew him when he was a cop, and I, you know, I, I think he's going to be a great mayor. But he was asked about the, the homeless, the visible homeless on the streets. And he said the problem is that it was an overreaction to Willowbrook, an uh, overreaction to that people were so shocked by Willowbrook, the mayor was saying, they emptied it out. And that's the homeless people. He totally got it wrong, confusing the hill. Yeah, he got confused because people were developmental and people with mental illness. Exactly. And that's why if he didn't know. If he doesn't know, that's a problem. And I think that, that the young people now have to guard against that. There's a difference between someone with Down syndrome and someone who's schizophrenic. Who is someone with a, you know another a kind of intellectual disability and someone who has mental illness? I, you know the problem is a year or two or three after Willowbrook, they closed Crete Moore and the other facilities for the mentally ill without providing the safety net that advocates were providing for the developmental disabilities. The, the people of the kids of Willowbrook, the the, the, the children of Willowbrook, so to speak. They had many more services than the the mentally ill. They closed Creed more, but they never followed through. They gave them drugs or whatever yeah. the, the, mo- the method, uh, what the moment was. But it, but for, for Mayor Adams to not know the difference shows you how we have to constantly be on guard against the false impression. And, and you know, I remember we were opening the first of the life work homes in in, in, uh, uh, in Queens, in Little Neck, Queens. Uh, and the neighbors were objecting. We don't want those people here. They're going to bring down the property values and so forth. And then we convinced them that, you know, on the contrary, these are great neighbors. And they just, you know, just give them a chance to be human, uh, to have humanity. I mean, it was a lot different than a homeless shelter. You know, I, I, I want the homeless, obviously, to be cared for. I want facilities for the mentally ill. I think that there has to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, there have to be places where mentally ill people can go if they're having a, a, whatever the illness is or the, uh, you know, the, the recurrence of the, of the whatever it is that they have. I want them, obviously, to be served, but they are not the population from Willowbrook. And I think people should not confuse the two. You want humanity for everybody, but what's good for the goose is not necessarily good for the gander in this particular case. Back to the A. Back to the A. Back to the A. In the state of Alabama, they put a group home down to the ground, killed everybody in the house. That's how bad it was. It's a, they're uh, not understanding. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So another question that's come in is, how do we make sure that we get that story out there? How can we work with journalists to get that story out there? I, my brother just reminded me of what the solution was. When Vicki Schnepps, the director or the, the, the founder of Life's Work, she has a Wilbur parent. What she did was she, re, you know, she's a very renowned publisher now, a very important person in the media, Vicki Schneff. What she did was she reached out to Eric Adams and said, "Come to the Geraldo home. We're going to show you what, where you are wrong, and why this population makes great neighbors, and this is a, a different problem than the one you, as a, you know, as a new mayor, uh, will be would be dealing with in terms of the homelessness and all the rest of it." It was his seeing. And I think that's a good solution to a lot of the misunderstanding is let the, let the community have access. Not like Willowbrook where you have lock and key. And you want people to, to come and see and, and feel optimistic. And you look at this wonderful place and uh, Sally goes to work at the workshop or 
uh, you know, Mike does, uh, uh, you know, look how nice it is. He's getting uh, language or he's more ambulatory or there's some progress or there's some evolution. You know, education comes from exposure to knowledge. And I think that Mayor Adams now understands where he was wrong and now he's, you know, an advocate now. So I'm, I'm also hearing from people involved in the long uh, telling of the story of Willowbrook that we have many lectures from Dr. Wilkins, we have interviews with Bernard on the on uh, Willowbrook Revisited, this program that Diane Bellioli created, and so there are resources so people can hear those stories, but we're trying to make sure that they reach a broader audience, and what a wonderful event tonight to have so many people coming from all over the world. I'm hearing in the in the questions that many people are students at different universities studying to become teachers, inclusive teachers. Many people are, are you know, parents looking back on this, family members of other people who are residents. What's what to me is always very striking is the trauma that many of these families experience. You know, the the sister or the brother of the the child who was sent to Willowbrook, who disappeared from their life, and to watch the pain of the parents who've lost that child, and the difficulty of maintaining that relationship. And it is really striking to me how important it is to value those and honor those familial ties, not to let them simply be erased as not, you know, those residents were not connected to anybody. They were just residents. They're family members. They're brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and, and cousins and children. And that's what I'm hearing from people, that what you've done is allowed them, for many of them, this was the first opportunity that the family could discuss what they had experienced. Some people say that they watched it they snuck away to watch it because it was too traumatic for their parents to address, but they as siblings needed to hear the story. So what you've done is a tremendously important thing. You know, Bernard sharing his story is tremendously important, and that just comes through so clearly in the comments from the audience, and I want to make sure that those reach you. Because, you know, it's nice to be able to look back on those on a dark afternoon <laughs> and realize how important that work has been. So I just, I want to thank you so much on behalf of the many people who have been saying that in the, in the Q&A. As I said, I, I, I feel so deeply immersed. I am, I am you, I say to the families. Bernard and I, we have a, we have a great relation. We love talking to people about what happened and where we are and as I, as I said you, I point I point to him you know he's uh, he's the past and he's the future and, and then no one's going to speak out for you unless you speak out for yourself in all aspects of life whatever your, your, your story is and he's building that future <laughs> and if you can come up with a solution to a problem a great idea Look at uh, Elon Musk and Tesla. Just donated, what, $6 billion? I mean, that's what I want you to do. Go out there and invent something and donate $6 billion uh, 20 years from now. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 I, I, I think, I know this problem still. I mean, the community-based residences still have a resistance here or there. They're always perennial funding problems, always staffing problems. There's always something going on, and yet, this is one of those stories where it's not like global warming, the world is ending, or we're going to have war on Ukraine. It's one of those stories, one of those precious stories where you could say, we started there, and now we're here, and here's a lot better than there. It's been, it's been a, 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 quite a, an odyssey, bumpy road, but there's no doubt that here is much better than there. And the future with self-advocacy, with familial involvement, with the continued, uh, uh, you know, I cannot emphasize enough that silence is, I don't want to say death, it's not death, but silence is not going to work for anybody. You've got to speak out. 
know what you're talking about. But I just want to say one thing about the families and running into the families. You know, it's it, it's been so long. It started with on the on the street. You know, my uh, you know I saw Willowbrook, and you know my uncle John. I want to personally say thank you to Geraldo Rivera. Without him bringing light to what was actually going on behind those closed doors, people may not have ever known. And it's due to him that this place was eventually shut down. Geraldo Rivera and Bernard form such an amazing friendship. It is so heartwarming how close they are and I love that they call each other brother. I just absolutely love that. Bernard has actually gone on to continue his education and he's made so many strides in his life. I promise you that for as long as I'm breathing, I will stay associated with the College of Staten Island, said Mr. Rivera. I applaud everything that they have done to remember the roots of this place. And here is Geraldo and Bernard going to the Willowbrook Mile. I just absolutely cherish the bond that these two men have. It's absolutely beautiful. Bernard, what you've had to overcome, you are so amazing. Everything you have accomplished, your resilience, and just your absolutely beautiful attitude and spirit. You are truly such a special young man. And I wanna make sure I personally thank you too, because without you, working with Geraldo, again, none of it would have been possible. I'm going to attempt to read this. You guys know I stumble over my words. It's real. I'm true to who I am, and that's who I am. This is Milestone 6, Exposing Conditions at Willowbrook. Willowbrook State School, the largest facility in the world for people diagnosed with mental retardation. I hate that word. Have been criticized for years. In 1965, Senator Robert F. Kennedy visited and called the investigation, called for an investigation, but no action was taken. In 1971, Staten Island Advance reporter Jane Curtin published a series of powerful articles revealing the appalling conditions, but no changes resulted. Two Willowbrook physicians, William Bronson and Michael Wilkins, have been meeting with families and staff to mobilize advocacies and overcrowding. They brought ABC journalist Rivaldo Rivera onto the scene in the middle of the night to film the horrendous conditions. Geraldo Rivera onto the grounds in the middle of the night. I read that already, I'm sorry. Rivera's 1972 expose remains the most explosive and realistic television investigation of the cold, stark, inhumane nature of institutions. The expose set the foundation for the consent judgment of 1975 establishing that Willowbrook residents had a constitutional right to be, to be protected from harm, a clear cornerstone in the civil rights movement for people with disabilities. I absolutely love that. I love that milestone. That's beautiful. And the acknowledgement for Geraldo is there. I do want to apologize to the nursing staff. Um, I was a little critical. I know you were working under the conditions you were handed with, and I do owe you an apology. There's really not much more I can say. I mean, the videos speak for themselves, so there's not much more I can say. I just know that this was a difficult video to watch, and for those who were able to stick through it, I definitely thank you for being here and sticking through the video. Um, your support means so much, but it's so important that we disclose things that were going on that were unattended to. 
As both Geraldo and Bernard have stated, it's so important to keep the knowledge of what had gone on there. This way, new generations can move forward with keeping progress going, which is a lot of the reason that I make some of these videos that I make, because these things happened years ago, and a lot of the new generation doesn't know why a lot of the rules and laws apply. So it's important to continue to shed light. Again, guys, I want to thank you for being here. You guys are troopers. I'm sorry. I know this was very sensitive material. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, and the notification bell. And remember, every day is a mystery.